morning. Good morning. morning. Uh, what a day, huh? <laughs> Let's just say thank you that we don't live in the Northeast. Yay! Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Oh, I tell you, yeah. <laughs> So good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to our fabulous fellowship. As you know, my name is Sally Watts. For those watching this for the first time, my name is still Sally Watts. <laughs> I want to remind everybody that we are here on this land started by the first people of Florence. Well, not started, but I believe they were the first people of Florence, the Sayusla Indians. And we are grateful to them for uh, being good stewards of this land and giving us an opportunity to meet here today and like we have been doing for many, many years. So, blessings to the tribe. Let's officially open our service, shall we? We're going to sing Spirit of Life. You can turn to number 123 in your hymn, or the words are in the program on the front if you just want to follow along. Tubi's going to lead us with uh, Spirit of Life, and uh, yeah, you ready? With a smile. With a smile. <laughs>
And then the, uh, the fog group's going to go hiking on the second, going to the Wax Myrtle Trail. So we'll be here at Foof and Carpool or Caravan. Next week we have Dean Schrock returning to us. And then next Wednesday the 9th is a Foof board meeting at 3.30. Okay? So that's it for announcements there. I have one here, a thank you letter from KXCR, just so you know, two of you, we got a nice uh, letter from KXCR. They want to express their deepest gratitude for the $1,072 we contributed to them. Congratulations, everybody here. Your support encourages our organization to pursue our goals, to inform, educate, entertain, and inspire. So thank you all who contributed to KXCR through our community giving program uh, this month. Our community partner is SOS, Saigsla Outreach Services. We'll talk more about that later. Also, you're going to receive a special invitation uh, in email later today with, uh, with the recording of today. It's an invitation to join FUFERS here next Wednesday at noon. The Chamber of Commerce has um, contracted with this wonderful motivational speaker by the name of Courtney McDermott. And she'll be sharing her thoughts on how to turn anxiety into peace. This is sponsored by the Chamber, and you can I'll send you information. You can either enroll online by yourself and watch it from home, because we're a Chamber member, it's only $10. Or you can join us here at FOOF. We've already purchased one viewing, so we're going to turn on the TV and watch it together. So you'll get some information on that. Um, I think it'd be pretty good. Uh, the Chamber did a really good job finding this person and partnering with other organizations throughout the state of Oregon. Usually this woman, I don't know, I think she, her fees are upwards of ten, twenty thousand dollars mm -hmm. and she wow. did this for a much reduced price. So, um, the, our organization, FOOF, we are members of the Chamber, so we get a lot of these uh, opportunities that we want to pass on to you, okay? Following today's service, Catherine will be here for anybody who would like a spiritual mind treatment. Mm -hmm. And as we have been delving into climate change the last few weeks or months or years, today is no different. Our speaker today is Aurora Miller. She was unable to be with us in person, unfortunately, but we do have a recorded message from her. She's going to talk about climate change and, you know, the effects of it. Mark will be here afterwards. He's our resident expert here in Florence. So we can have, continue a conversation about what that means and how we can all be a part of, you know, helping our little city become better and more um, climately adaptive. I'm making this up as I go. <laughs> so, anyway, um, we want to help to protect what we have here and what can we do. What can we do as a fellowship? What can we do as foofers to help this become reality? Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty cool. So, are there any other announcements anybody wishes to share? Deborah, yes, please. Well, last week we had a very successful wine fundraiser. All of the reds sold out within a few minutes after the service ended. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you, everybody. Are you saying we're all red? <laughs> no. um, we do have two wines left. They're 2020 Muscat. I think that they are $19, and none of us knew what a Muscat was last week, which is why I think that they didn't sell. So I looked it up. Donna says that that is her very favorite wine out of all the wines at the winery. And it is an aromatic yet delicate wine with tropical fruit notes and floral qualities. Perfect with spicy food or for sipping. So if anybody likes whites, you can see me after service. <laughs> or go grab those bottles now, because they might be gone by the time service is over. Just kidding. Just kidding. So thank you. So we had 12 bottles, and then we've sold 10, and two more left, and it's a nice fundraiser. So thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Reverend Smith, Reverend Donna Smith, our friend who comes here on the third Sunday every month. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I remind everybody to remain fully masked. I know it's the yada, yada, yada stuff we have to say. Unless you're standing behind here, then you're welcome to take off your mask. <sighs> Any other announcements? What do you say we light our chalice? Yeah, yeah. I've asked Judy if she would help light this chalice. The words come from Charles Flagg. And it's titled, Every Endeavor Begins with a First Step. 
first step is trying to light the flame. No, I'm putting it right there. Right there. Mm -hmm. Did it work? Thank you. It's a little quieter, although it creates much angst. I know, I know. Every endeavor, including finding solutions to climate change, begins with a first step and encounters darkness and difficulty along the way. We know the darkness of ignorance, of fear, and of tyranny. Yet we know the dawning of the light, the beginnings of hope, and the renewal of life. Blessed be the eternal power which inspires us to kindle this light. Blessed be the source of light and all of life. Amen. Amen. Catherine, would you like to lead us in joys and concerns? Absolutely. I'll be happy to uh, hold the microphone and drop some shells. Yes. Thank you, Sally. You're welcome. Good morning, everyone. I have a few things to say this morning. thought I'd put them in with joys and concerns instead of announcements because they pertain to this. So for joys and concerns, this is the time we express ourselves as and to our community. Some of us came here already as Unitarians, and about half of us were attracted to the inclusive, loving atmosphere we couldn't find at other churches or gathering places. I have a few things to share today. Then if any of you want to share personally, as Sally said, she will hand you the microphone or bring it to you in your seat as we are dropping shells. First, a joy. Marcia, Phillips is finally returning home after her long stay. Yay. Oh, Marcia, I'm sorry. No, but okay, I have a first a joy, another joy. First, let's do this first. Marcia Phillips is now living at Spruce Point and would like Marcia Pierce. Oh, Marcia, that's why I wrote it the same thing. Marcia Pierce. I know Marcia. that. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. So, Marcia Pierce, who is a, was a minister here. Thank you for putting up with this. A favorite minister. Is now living at Spruce Point, and she would like visitors. That's the joy. She would like visitors. Thank you, Steve Earnshaw, for your, this information. This is such good news. So call at Spruce Point and find out, you know, when and how she wants these visitors, okay? And, I mean, this is great. It went pretty smooth, you know, and this is good. Okay, another joy. Marsha Phillips is finally returning home after her long stay in rehabilitation in Eugene. She probably wants to acclimate to her home surroundings for a bit, so let's be respectful of that. But, I mean, this is great. This has been months, and she's going to be at home, so it's wonderful. And uh, I do have a card in the back of the room if anyone wants to sign it, welcoming her home. And I'll make sure the card gets delivered, okay? Instead of just the, us at the care committee signing it, we thought, you know, it would give it a little more power if someone, you know, more of us signed it, okay? So now I have a concern. I have a couple things to say about this. Raymond Davis is recovering at home after a week's long stay in ICU in Eugene. She is slowly getting stronger but needs some assistance. This brings me to my final point. Services in this town seem hard to come by at the moment, like everywhere. Rayma is signed up for Meals on Wheels and Home Care Assistance but neither organization has responded to her repeated calls. This is everywhere. You may notice the very long lines at the pharmacies, etc. There's just been a little bit of breakdown, especially in the rural areas, okay? Ashley was her contact from the care committee, but she's not feeling up to it right now. That's the information I got. Judy Plummery stepped up since Rayma returned home, but she's going to visit her sister for a bit, and well, and it's a well-deserved visit. This is what is needed. On dialysis days, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, at about 4 p.m., Rayma needs assistance with dinner. She is too weak, and I've seen her after a dialysis day. I went there last week, and it's... Yeah, she's too weak to do it. This consists of making a salad or heating soup, 
you know, which she has there at home. I know it's a lot to ask for someone to go into someone's home during COVID, but there may be some of you that feel all right being masked and going in. You know, we talk about helping our community partners, you know, like the cold weather shelter and everything in person, but there's a need in our own community as well, just to you know, mention that. So if anyone wants to volunteer, see me after. Also, if anyone wants to make some soup or a casserole for Rayma, that would be good as well. She has no food restrictions. This won't last for more than a few weeks, and hopefully her assigned services will kick in sometime soon. Sometime soon. All right, that was long, but also all needed. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone else? A joy or a concern? Ron, you want me to bring it to you? I attended the school board meeting this past week, and it was quite frightening how many parents and kids were there complaining that they were not, they don't want to wear masks when they're sitting on the bench in a sporting event. Uh, they don't want to wear a mask in lunch at lunchtime when they're all sitting together, and the parents are supported this very vociferously. Um, my own grandkids, my grandchild Jack went played a basketball game before he went on Christmas break. They went to Mexico and he came down with COVID. Every kid on his team came down with COVID. Jack had been vaccinated, so it was relatively mild. His brother caught COVID from him. He was not vaccinated, he was too young. He had a hard time. Now, these are both strong, active kids. The thing that worries me most is we don't know long-term effects, what's going to happen to, to children, adults or children. It, it hasn't been with us at all. But the parents of these children, they just don't care. Let them play sports, let them socialize, I don't understand it. Drop your shelf for me in a minute. Anybody else? Do you want to come up front, Mark? Oh, okay. I don't know. <laughs> right after here. Okay. So I'm on the program committee, and as the program committee, I contacted one of our very, very, very favorite ministers, Sarah Scotchko, to see if she would be interested in speaking with us sometime in the next few months. She told me she was not taking new appointments because she expects very quickly to be on maternity leave. Oh! oh. 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 Yay! Oh! So, okay. congratulations, Sarah, if you yes. ever watch this. And uh, not so much a joy for us, but certainly for her. We could have vicariously <laughs> been joyful for her while we miss her. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, I'm Sarah Scotchko. I'm the Director of on Friday, Jim and I go to San Diego to represent our fellowship at the Pacific Western Regional Assembly. So if anybody has any concerns they want to pass on, let me know. Um, but part of the joy of, of Jim and I getting to go is that we have family in San Diego that we get to go visit for the weekend. So we're happy. Yay. <laughs> And yeah, congratulations and thank you, Kara, for representing our fellowship. Oh, yes, absolutely. It's a, it's a struggle. It's, it's <laughs> so, uh, last Sunday we had a capacity crowd uh, for the panel discussion over at uh, St. Andrews. Um, in fact, we had almost as many people online as we had in person. And uh, that means that if everyone had been able to show up in person, we would not have had room. So I'm looking for a larger space. I think I found one, but it's not confirmed yet for the next event. Uh, and that will be a, an interfaith convocation on how to approach climate change from our scriptural references towards taking care of the earth um, so far, I have the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, of course, the Unitarians, um, our Jewish group, uh, the Methodists, and 
I've been, been in contact with the Friends, the Quakers, uh, and the Baha'i group, and the Lutherans. So, a number of different groups, and we hope to have other spiritual disciplines, Buddhists included, uh, come and everyone speak to the issue from their spiritual or religious traditions. It's going to be in early April before, uh, well, it'll be during Lent, but it'll be before Easter, it'll be before Passover, and it'll be leading up to uh, Earth Day and Arbor Day, which come up later in April. So kind of you know, build momentum. Um, I also, I have, uh, if you haven't signed this already, Mike and Pat Allen's uh, climate petition to the city. And I'm going to leave it back on the table over there uh, if you uh, feel so inclined to sign it. Um, he's got something like 750 signatures so far. I know a lot of people have already signed it, uh, but that'll be back there. Um, and then I have one short thing. It's not really a concern. Um, Ann Lathrop would like to hear from people. She hasn't been getting out, and I don't think she's been here for the last month or two. Um, but I did go over and uh, spend an afternoon with her. I don't know how much she wants to have people actually coming, but um, give her a call and just say, hi, we're thinking of you. And, uh, you know, she's, she's living there by herself now over at uh, uh, Driftwood Shores. So, um, and I think that's, that's, oh, well, the discussion afterward. We'll talk more about this wonderful uh, talk that Aurora uh, has put together. There you go. For show. Thank you very much, and thank you for that info on Anne. That's a good reminder for all of us. Put one in for her, too. Yeah, please do. Thank you. Excellent. The, um, my uh, joy, I think, is to be a joy. On the way here today, I was thinking about my great aunt. Now, my great aunt was a part of the leadership council, I guess you'd call it, of St. John's Lutheran Church in Chicago, a small little entity that, you know, takes up a whole city block. Um, I think it's just on the other side of Catholicism, so they kind of patterned after that. But anyway, she asked me what it would take to bring new people into the church, because they have the same issue that everybody else has with groups like this, is how you bring people in. And one of the things that I told her was, worry about saving her soul some of the day, but look for ways to bring them in to your program. And looking around here today, I realize that almost everybody here participates in some way in our what we do here, which is wonderful because that is that is what it's kind of like going to a potluck. It makes it that much more tasty because everybody participated, and that's just the feeling that I had this morning. So. Thank you, Jay. Well said. Anyone else? Anyone else? So please place a final shell in there, Sally, for anyone that we don't know. Anyone that's out there that can even hear that, but I mean, we just include you in our minds and in our hearts. Anyone that we can think about right now, just by saying it, you are included. Blessed be. Thank you, Catherine. You do such a great job of keeping everybody informed, keeping in touch with those who are precious to us. And uh, blessings to everybody we talked about. Marcia, Marcia, Rayma, um, Anne, and everybody else. Uh, we miss you, we love you, and um, just know that, okay? So we have a responsive reading, and then we're going to go into our, our lovely program. The responsive reading is number 648. If you will open this up, I tried to find something that was indicative of the topic for today. There's nothing in there that says, oh, let's do a reading on climate change. <laughs> but uh, this is, I, I, I kind of liken it to the fact of, you know, some of us, we're in the beginning stages, maybe, maybe we're in the late stages, but beginning because it's right now, today, we are beginning to seriously, again, look at climate change as an issue. 
So uh, beginnings or beginners, I thought would be a good a good responsive reading. It's number six forty eight. But we have only begun to love the earth. We have only begun to imagine the fullness of life. How could How we tire of hope? hope? So, so much, much is in blood. How can we desire fail? We have only begun to imagine justice and mercy. Only begun to envision how it might be to live as siblings with beast and flower, mountains and grass. Surely our river cannot already be hastened into the sea of non being. Surely it cannot drag in the salt all that is innocent. Not yet, not yet. There is too much broken that must be mended. Too much hurt that we have done to each other that cannot be mended. We have only begun to know the power that is in us if we would join our solitudes in the communion of struggle. So much is so the unfolding that must be completed. So much is it but. So we have today a special program. I'm reminded that years ago, well, let me put it to the present tense. We have been in this space now for well over 10 years. And for well over 10 years, we have been evolving as a fellowship to be more spiritual, more loving, more compassionate. Previous years, when we first started, Ruth will know this, we had a lot of Sundays at 6 p.m. And it was a lot about social justice. There was a tipping point where it was a lot of social justice and not much spiritual. And eventually we kind of started to tip the scales where we bring spiritual messages to you every Sunday. We hope, we strive. And every once in a while there's one of those social justice topics that we're going to pop in to keep us honest, to keep us balanced, if you will. Aurora Miller happens to be the daughter of Reverend Ruth Miller. She spoke to us a couple of years ago about the butterfly effect, uh -huh. right? Yes. Lovely talk. This particular talk by Aurora is on climate change. So it's not fluffy, okay? But it should inspire some thoughts that you have. It should inspire maybe you to want to take action. It hopefully will inspire you to want to stay around after service today and meet with Mark and talk honestly how Foof might be a better partner in this spiritual challenge we have of how we be on this planet, how we help Florence be a better community. And it's not just about the evils of climate change, but it's about recognizing what's going on and what we can do to be a part of the, the resolution. Am I right, Mark? Is that pretty? Absolutely. Okay. So I want you to watch this program by Aurora. We thank her for putting this together. When we're done, I'm going to ask that we go into a quiet meditation so you can think about what she provided. And then we'll finish with offering chalice lighting, peace song, and then Mark will be here and we'll talk further. Does that make sense? So I'm going to ask Jim if he'll come forward and help me, or Jay. Go. I met the artist who did that uh, painting, by the way. Mm -hmm. Brooks Anderson's been around for a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn this light off. Jim, could you hit the lights in the back where you're still up? Yeah. So Aurora, I know she wanted to be here with us if she could. She lives in Portland, so it's a little difficult to schedule travel when you don't know what the weather's going to be. But this is Aurora Miller. This is Ruth's daughter. And uh, please, take to heart what she has to offer, and we'll talk about it later, okay? Thank you, Jim. Is there hope for climate change? Let's find out. Over the course of this next few minutes, I'm going to talk about why is this happening? Why are we having climate change? Some of us know some answers, others know other answers, but really putting it all together is so important. We're going to talk about who predicted this and why and why we weren't able to take action when we knew, some of us knew, that this was going to be happening. It's important to understand why this is happening and why we didn't take action so that we can identify how to change that pattern moving forward. And of course, what can we do now that we're in this situation? 
there are a lot of contributing factors to climate change. Some of it, of course, is natural cycles of the planet. But evidence does show that fossil fuel, fossil fuel consumption is a big part of it, right? Carbon dioxide going into our atmosphere, creating this sort of bubble that traps heat in so that it can't escape. Also, all of the fossil fuels that we're using, not just for fuel, but also to make plastics, all of the single use plastics that we have, that process also creates toxins and creates heat and creates garbage that makes it difficult for our ecosystems to thrive along with deforestation. As we've been cutting down and clearing out acres and acres, millions of acres of forests, of jungles, of wood all over our planet, that's inhibiting our ability to process those CO that CO2 and those toxins. The trees are basically the Earth's lungs. Right? So imagine all you could ever do was take a breath in and you couldn't take a breath out to release the CO2 in your body. It would be a problem. So we need to have those trees to process all of that CO2. So it becomes sort of this combination of factors that we're creating more CO2, but we're also having fewer opportunities to process the CO2, and it becomes this horrible cycle that we're stuck in. Also concrete, right? Urban environments are, tend to be much, much hotter than rural environments in large part because of all of that concrete. All of the roads, all of the buildings, it traps the heat in. So at night, it's then emanating that heat off and raising the temperatures overall, rather than out here in the country where we have grass and we have trees and all of these things that absorb the heat and don't continue to reflect it off at night. Also, food waste is a surprisingly significant source of heat on our planet. If you think about, ideally, all of the food that is consumed on the planet by any animal goes into the cycle, goes into the ecosystem and gets broken down and turned into resources for the plants, right? It's that food web, that spinning cycle but we're removing the food from that cycle, putting it in plastic bags where it still decomposes, still gives off heat, but it's trapped and it's not able to re-enter the cycle that we need it to in order to keep our planet systems balanced. So all of these different things that we're doing are creating greater levels of heat. And the latest, uh, report that came out said that we're now at 1.1 degrees Celsius above what was pre-industrial levels of temperature. And we're all freaking out that if we get to two degrees Celsius, that's like a really big deal. We're hoping to maybe hold it off at 1.5. So all of these different contributing factors are making it more likely to continue raising that temperature rather than cutting it off and bringing that temperature back down by processing our CO2 more effectively, finding better ways to cool down rather than things like concrete, finding ways to bring our food waste back into the systems, back into the cycles so that they're not creating all of that additional heat. But Climate change is not just about warming. Yes, I know I was just talking about 1.1 degrees Celsius and that is a big deal. But part of what's happening as a result of that increase of temperature is all of these other weather patterns that are forming. So when we talk about climate, we're not just talking about global warming. We're also talking about droughts, floods, blizzards, hurricanes, famines, all of these other things that are happening on the planet as a result of these shifts in temperatures. So this is why if you have a sudden and unexpected blizzard, people will say, oh, how's that global warming working out for you? It's still a result of the changing temperatures on our planet. 
even though it's really a lot colder in the moment, in the locale. And we'll get to why in just a second. So all of these changes in temperatures are having a dramatic effect on our oceans. The ocean's temperature is changing and all of the ice that's melting is sending water with a different salinity, right? So the amount of salt versus fresh water, acids versus bases, it's changing the salinity of our oceans and it's also changing the currents and we'll talk a little bit more about currents in just a second but what's important to recognize in all of this is the impact that's having on the ecosystem of the ocean all of the species that aren't able to survive in these changing environments they have a very stable set of temperatures and salinities that they can thrive in so things like phytoplankton and algaes and corals that also help to process that CO2 aren't able to survive in these changing environments. So this change in the ocean is really, really significant. It's also significant in the context of how our earth moves, okay? So this image here is showing the Gulf Stream, the current, the sort of conveyor belt that runs through all of our oceans. And you can see the warm water going up to the Arctic and then cooling off immediately, going down, going along the ocean's floor and continuing in that cycle all over the world. Our shipping lines are totally dependent on this. So are our whales, our birds, all of the migratory species depend on this global conveyor belt of the ocean. And unfortunately, because of the changing temperatures that we're seeing, that conveyor belt is slowing down because the change in temperature isn't dramatic enough to force that shift down from the hot to the cool and move it down along the ocean. So unfortunately, we're starting to see that those currents are slowing down and that could have a dramatic impact on our ability to travel through the ocean, to send things from one country to another country because our shipping lanes are being impacted so dramatically. Also, along with the ocean, we're seeing changes in the jet streams. The Gulf Stream is for the water, the jet stream is for the air. And when we had a really solid, stable polar ice cap, the jet stream was also very stable. It tended to just, you know, spiral along the top, spread towards the, the northern part during the summer, spread a little bit farther south during the winter as things cooled down more. But with all of these changes in the ocean, we're also seeing these changes in the air. The jet stream isn't stable any longer. It's becoming kind of loosey-goosey, which is why we're seeing some of these really dramatic changes in weather as the cold air comes farther south than it typically did and the hot air goes further north than it typically did. We're seeing all of these changes in rainfall and other kinds of precipitation like blizzards, hurricanes, droughts, all of these things are a result of these changes in the jet stream and where the hot air is going, where the cold air is going, and it's no longer as stable as it was. So we're going to be seeing much more dramatic weather changes happening over the course of the next several years as this system continues to degenerate due to the changing temperatures. So all of the things that we're looking at, the extreme weather events, that's also going to have a significant impact on the ecosystems, right? We were talking about the ocean and all of the systems that are happening there, the forests, all of the changes that are happening there. And then, of course, all of the other ecosystems, the plants, the animals, the way that life functions on this planet are going to start breaking down because all of that stability that they have counted on is lost. 
Unfortunately, we'll probably also see an increase in diseases as changes in water, whether we can have clean water, whether there's enough of it, you know, and all of the other ways in which diseases tend to flourish, we're likely to see more of that. So as we think about every way that we've been impacted by COVID, what else might be looming in front of us in terms of other diseases that might latch on and take hold and become more and more difficult to eradicate? Changes in weather also mean crop failures, droughts and floods impact our ability to grow the food that we need to survive. And with the population the size that we have, we're already facing starvation in so many parts of the world. So having those dramatic impacts on our crops is really scary. What if the day comes when we're not able to grow animals, we're not able to grow crops anymore? So we need to really start thinking about these things now and find ways to take action and also to bear in mind that with all of these changes, as certain parts of the world become less and less stable, we will of course see greater human conflicts, more migration as people find that they're not able to survive in their homelands. So finding ways to cope with that, to strategize around that, this is a lot y'all. <laughs> I'm getting a little bit emotional and I'm just talking about it. But when we think about all of these things that we're facing, it's very, very scary. So remember to take some time, soothe yourself. Your nervous system might be acting up. Take a few deep breaths and stick around because we will get to the hopeful part, I promise you. Before we do though, we need to talk about what led to this? Who saw this coming? So there were some scientists that saw the impact of carbon dioxide in our environment back in 1896. Even for boomers, that's a long time ago. It's well over a century ago now that we began to see the impact of this. And then that research was leveraged in the 50s, in the 60s and well into the 70s by as we saw more and more conflicts happening with our greenhouse gases we saw you know cities that were hugely polluted with smog we made a lot of wonderful changes at that time but even from the reports that were filed in 1965 in LBJ's administration there was a lot that was called for in terms of action that was never followed up on. And we'll get to why in just a second, but think about how long we've known about this and why we haven't taken action. Because when we understand why, then we're in a better position to break that cycle and move forward into a new way of being. I, of course, am a huge science fiction fanatic, so I had to drop in a couple of names of science fiction authors who were talking about climate change very, very early on and somewhat later on, but still super relevant. Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower. If you haven't read it, do yourself a favor. It's very important reading given where we are and what we might be looking at. So why didn't we do something? Well, for a, from a cultural perspective, there are a lot of reasons why. But I think a lot of it comes down to a cultural belief that we as humans are above nature. We're outside of the systems that flourish in nature. We don't think of ourselves as being a part of ecosystems. We don't think of ourselves as being a part of the environment in which we live which comes from a bunch of different reasons, but is deeply problematic. As much as we don't want to believe it, we're still animals. We're still a part of all of the systems on this planet, which is why our actions have such a significant impact on the systems in which we live. 
I personally think that some of it comes from the ways in which we built villages early on hundreds and hundreds of years ago where you, the forest was out there, the wilds were out there, but here, this is our village, this is where we live, and we told each other stories, fairy tales and fables about how wild and scary the outside world was, and that built within us a sense of separation. There's also, of course, the Judeo-Christian idea that's handed down in the Bible and other works that talks about man being placed in charge of the world. And I'm not trying to slam on anybody's religion. I'm a super big fan of everybody worshiping in the ways that feel good to them. But it is important to recognize that those concepts reinforce the idea that we're separate from the world in which we live when in fact we're deeply deeply enmeshed we're deeply interwoven we are a part of the world in which we live we are a part of all of the ecosystems that feed us that give us water that process our elimination all of these things are a part of the system of the planet and we have to recognize that in order to be able to get back on track in a way that is truly and deeply sustainable. So along with all of those, <laughs> we also have this idea of how important technology is. And look, I'm talking to you on a computer. Obviously, I really enjoy technology and all of the gifts that it gives us. But I think it does reinforce that idea of being separate from nature, of being able to control nature. And I think that's part of why, as we're looking at what changes have and haven't been made, so often we're talking about how can we fix it? How can we exert our will over nature to bring it back on track while not really talking about finding that balance, coming back into that system so that we can find the sustainability that we need in order to thrive over the long term. So along with that, there's also this I versus we mindset, the manifest destiny, the colonialization and neo-colonialism, this idea that I am separate from us when in fact, we all need to be able to flourish together. If one part of the system is flawed, all of the system is less effective. So if we can begin to look at ourselves as we instead of I, we'll start to see some opportunities there that we might not otherwise see. And of course, I can't talk about climate change and why we didn't make changes without talking about power mongers, the oligarchs, the hegemonies, all of these people who are more focused on winning capitalism and being better, bigger, stronger, having more than others, right? That goes right back to the I versus we concept, but it's also about, well, let me exert my political capital so that I can get my needs and desires met and everybody else can go, you know, right? So when we look at all of these influences that have coalesced to where we are now, recognizing the power disparity in our society is really significant. We need to take that into account. And along with that, this idea that we're here to grow, right? Going back to that colonialism, neo-colonialism, expansion, let's get bigger, consume more, have more people, have a greater audience, have more money, all of this idea of growth, as opposed to how can we be sustainable? How can we make sure that our systems are functioning as efficiently and effectively as possible? It's a very different way to look at the world, but maybe some dramatic world shifts are exactly what we need right now in order to see the changes that will help us all thrive in the coming years. On an individual level, why didn't I do more? I mean, I've known about this for a long time. How much have I really done? And you might be asking yourself the same question. Guilt and shame, they don't do us a lot of good, 
right? But it does help us to acknowledge what our mindset has been so that we can identify what needs to change so that we can move forward. I talk about this Cassandra complex, right? Cassandra was this prophetess in ancient Greece who was cursed to always speak the truth, but nobody would believe her. And I think we've seen a fair amount of that in the scientific community. All of these people saying, help, help, this is a big problem. And everybody going, yeah, 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 you know, whatever. Okay, chicken little. So I think that there might be a little bit of this Cassandra complex going on in part because when we think about how big, how dire this situation is, we feel stressed out. We feel afraid, we feel overwhelmed, and our bodies will naturally try to distance ourselves as a defense mechanism from the things that make us freak out. So it is understandable that we've been having difficulty finding ways to take more significant action as individuals. And look, I'm not trying to sit here and say, it's the job of the individuals to fix this, when in fact so much of the problems are coming from corporations. I'm not saying that, but we are a world made up of individuals. So if we're gonna see change, individuals have to make that change. I don't know how much of it is gonna be grassroots, how much of it is gonna be, you know, some really amazing benefactor who steps in and is like, all right, y'all, I'm one of those billionaires who's actually going to make a difference, but we do need to look at our individual roles in this as well. And it's totally natural to be asking yourself, I'm just one person in a world of billions. What can I really do? How much is it going to matter if I don't put my food waste in plastic bags? How much is it going to matter if I turn off my air conditioner or if I tear up the concrete on a road? I'm not urging that kind of rebellion necessarily, but um, we do need to look at the ways in which we tend to say, I'm so small, what can I do? Because I think that's a question that a lot of us ask ourselves. And when we are ready and willing and able to say, you know what, I am one person, what can I do about it? That's when real change becomes possible. So what can we do? We can commit to the possibility of significant cultural change. This climate change issue that we're having is indicative of a need for cultural change. All of those things that we were talking about and that are at the bottom of this screen, focusing on we versus I, focusing on sustainability rather than growth, helping other people to change their thinking. We need significant cultural change. And it can feel really scary and really impossible because our culture is so deeply entrenched. But what can I do? I can commit to the possibility of change. Commit to it. I love this James Baldwin quote, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Are you ready to commit to the possibility of significant cultural change? Are you ready to face what needs to shift in order for us to thrive as a race, as a species, as a planet? Because that's really what it's gonna take. And part of that is getting curious, asking questions, asking, what can I do? What might some solutions be? Curiosity is so powerful. On a neurological level, curiosity releases dopamine, which feels good, which reduces our stress, so yay. And it makes us more likely to find creative solutions to the problem. Realistically, climate change is gonna be about more than not putting our food in plastic bags and dealing with our air conditioners. It's so, so, so much more than that. We need creative solutions, things that we haven't thought about yet. 
And in order to find those solutions, we need to be creative. We need to be curious and we need to talk with one another, brainstorm, have a salon where there are no wrong answers. Just put everything up on the whiteboard and maybe something amazing will come from that. If you commit to the possibility of change, that's when the fun starts. So as you go through forward from this time, as you think about cultural change, climate change, all of this big scary stuff, remember cultural change is the result of lots and lots and lots of individual changes. So when you change, that's significant. If you change your mindset, if you change your actions, if you change your conversations, if you change the words that you're using, that's the beginning of cultural change. You can be a ripple, sending out other ripples and connecting other people to the possibility of a future we haven't even dreamed of. Our actions are the result of our mindset. So look at how your mindset is affecting your actions. Are you clinging to an outdated culture that doesn't acknowledge all of these sustainable systems? Or are you ready for a mindset that is open to wildly new possibilities and a glorious future for all of us? You have the power, but you have to have hope. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate you listening. I, I hope that you have hope and we'll all get there together. As I mentioned a few minutes ago before we started talking, I'd like to just go into a quiet uh, meditation. Jeff pre-recorded this particular piece called Remembering. So sit back and relax and think about what Aurora has shared and um, yeah, be nice and quiet.
Vicky. Oh. That was a rude awakening. It was a rude awakening. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Jeff. He pre records a lot of music for us that we can use whenever we need to. So. And thank you, Aurora. I, I had watched this before. I didn't quite take away what I took away today. So I appreciate the opportunity to, to watch this again. So we have an offering that we would like to share with you. We have ourselves, our particular fellowship. We are self-funded. We rely on the contributions of our members and friends. We rely on pledges that you might want to make. And we pass a basket for those who might want to contribute to its, our future. And we also have a, a community partner called SOS. Tuvia has just a, a brief something to share about SOS and the me, I, and the we thing. So what do you want to say there, Tuvia? Are you coming back here again? Okay. SOS is there for urgent need, and we must be aware of that, and we must help others. This is part of that component. But I want to take a minute to talk about another component of the offering, which is the most important component there is. And what would that be? That is about you and me and we. We are food, and without us, there is no need for the building. Without us, there is no partner for our community partners. Without us, there is no food. So we need to take care of we. And at the beginning, you talked, we talked about some people in our congregation that are in need. Let's take care of them. Uh, let's let's take care of ourselves. Treat yourself to a nice lunch today. Do something good for yourself. Do something good for your friends. Volunteer mm -hmm. to help us out. Mm -hmm. And do be cognizant of the planet. Attend Mark's session today, mm -hmm. because we all have a vested interest in our planet. Mm -hmm. So that is our way of life. So I'm reminded that if you're watching this today uh, and you'd like to make a financial contribution to us, you can mail us a check, payable to FOOF, mailed at uh, P.O. Box 2502 Florence, 97439. You can visit our website and click on the donate button. Uh, we have a basket to pass, and you know there is no expectation of everybody to give in this basket. But as it comes to you and you are unable to give today, at least hold the basket with your love and pass it to the next person. And from there, we will um, ask that you uh, enjoy the music provided by Tuvia. And I ask that you please repeat after me, divine love through me. Divine love through me. Blesses and multiplies all that I am. Blesses and multiplies all that I am. All that I receive. All that I receive. All that I give. All that I give. And I am prosperous now. I am prosperous now. Blessed be. Blessed be. So Tuvia is going to play some music. I'm going to ask if Catherine and maybe George would help us pass. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
received in grateful appreciation. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that's your> <laughs> 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 Jimmy said go have a good lunch. Jimmy said I had a good lunch, but not on us. <laughs> So, Catherine, would you help me extinguish the chalice? These closing words and chalice extinguishing come from Andrea Hawkins' camper. May we see all as it is, and may it all be as we see it. May we be the ones to make it as it should be, for if not us, who? If not now, when? This is answering the cry of justice with the work of peace. This is redeeming the pain in history with the grace of wisdom. This is the work we are called to do, and this is the call we answer now. To be the barrier and the bridge. To be the living embodiment of our principles. To be about the work of building the beloved community. To be a people of intention and a people of conscience. Blessed be. Ask that you form a circle around the chairs. We're going to sing our peace song. Two of you will lead us in that. And we're going to break very quickly thereafter, and we'll ask uh, Mark to come up forward and see if we can have a nice circle of conversation. Thank you, George. There you go, Rick. How you doing, man? Are you ready? Oh. 